Welcome to First Christian Church's Adult Fellowship Bible Study. We are at the end of our series on First Thessalonians, with this being lesson number 12 and the finale in our study of this book. We will read only verses 12 through 22 of chapter 5, as the final five verses are classic uh, closing and benediction that Paul uh, uses, and we've covered those in several other books that we've studied. So reading chapter 5, verses 12 through 22 in the New Revised Standard Version. But we appeal to you, brothers and sisters, to respect those who labor among you and have charge of you in the Lord and admonish you. Esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves, and we urge you, beloved, to admonish the idlers, encourage the faith-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all of them, so that none of you repay evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise the word of prophecy. But test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every evil, every form of evil. Recall from our most recent uh, lessons here in First Thessalonians that Paul is giving uh, ethical instructions or exhortations as they're more often called by scholars to these people for living according to the Judeo-Christian standards of conduct rather than the historical historical standards uh, of the Macedonian Greek people. Several scholars note he is doing it here in a more nurturing style than he has previously uh, done both in this book and in most of his other writings. Today's reading is divided into three uh, distinct sections, uh, teaches Dr. Abraham Smith at Southern Methodist University. He breaks it this way. Uh, he says verses 12 through 13 cover an exhortation for the building up of of uh, the church, while 14 and 15 are a warning against ret retribution in the church, and verses 16 through 22 address a sort of a wide range of what he calls catch-all type imperatives uh, given to these people. Dr. Gene Green, uh, in his commentary, says, here Paul reads as if he and Silas did not have time to lay out certain key criteria uh, for leadership before being run out of town. So this likely is a series of points aimed at improving uh, the emerging leadership uh, and the following of that leadership in the congregation. A key point is to have respect for all those who work hard among you. But what is this word respect here? Scholars uh, spent a lot of ink on that. That respect is, uh, in, is both for the identification of the leaders as well as for those who admonish them, be it one and the same is not clear. Uh, this is point made by several scholars. However, the Greek word here, translated respect, Dr. Green says, could just as equally be to honor, to recognize, or even to know. Uh, other Greek scholars, however, suggest it should not be translated to respect in modern English, uh, as both the New Revised Standard Version and the New International Version uh, do, both do. Such scholars believe the intended meaning at the time uh, of the writing was more likely 
something along what we might translate to recognize. And they cite that the likely problem is based on social history uh, related to these people uh, at the time in that appointed leaders in a church may very well have been people who they were appointing based on social order uh, or status in the community because that was the standard Greco-Roman uh, style in their society rather than appointing or trying to follow people who seem to have a better understanding of the theology and what Paul's message was in Christianity. That clearly was the custom to follow people who had rank in society. Uh, several scholars and the social historians especially note that. Thus Paul may very well be saying here, recognize as your leaders those doing the Lord's wishes or work for your church in your society rather than selecting people based only on their society rank society connections and society's influence. Dr. Green notes that work here is described uh, in sort of three ways uh, by inference. These who work hard among you likely means, he says, those focused on the welfare of the church and not on self-acclaim or improving their position in society. Those who admonish the congregation, likely meaning concerning, uh, admonish them concerning Christian doctrine and values and not uh, some other issue. Those among you who are over you in the Lord, uh, several scholars say more likely means the apostles and maybe even the Jerusalem council, uh, as well as local leaders that may come about but they believe the emphasis goes farther than the church than the local church concerning the respect issue uh, or wording dr beverly robert uh, gaventi at baylor uh, who we've used a lot in first thessalonians adds that that term is okay that translation is okay if it means paul is concerned uh, that the that these Thessalonians are not treating their leaders properly. But she reminds us that at this point in church development, all evidence indicates that ministerial offices have not yet been established. And we tend to get mixed up on that, she says, because we read the Bible with the fact that we think, you know, that some people think that the book of Acts came first, which is not the case. It's written many years later. So at, at this point in time, the scholars are telling us, and she's not the only one, that there is not these offices of church elders and so forth, and, and ministers and pastors, uh, and as far as formal offices. Her key point is that, that then is this, that Paul is unlikely speaking about respect for an office. Rather, the respect is for the individual. And which individuals? The individuals that are doing the work of the church, the work in the church, theologically, doctrinal, and, and the needs of people. Doing the work on a day-to-day -day basis. She suggests such is Paul's focus here because the follow-up, stand alone, uh, in the Greek, she says, it makes better sense. That is, that be at peace among yourselves. That is, to come together around those teachers and, le and leaders uh, relative to those who are following the Lord's message rather than following the wishes of some influential community leader trying to keep you uh, halfway into the pagan society. So she suggests there is an implied meaning here to recognize what God's will is for your church and follow those leading you in that direction. We should note that in the five verses we did not read that are at the end of this word, Paul gives some final instructions. 
that he ch one of the things he does there is charge the receivers of this letter to have it read to the entire congregation in his in his very closing remarks there and many scholars point out that this is in part likely because several scholars because several of these interfering leaders if you will wherever the problem was there uh, may very well he may feel that they very well would take this and uh, read it in a narrow click in the church uh, and not therefore to the wider or entire church audience, uh, audience so he therefore is demanding in his letter that it be read aloud to all which was not I mean that was customary probably to do anyway but it, he's emphatic here however uh, despite these comments that I've made so far from the scholars there is an alternative interpretation uh, here that's quite common among some denominations of Christians they clearly interpret this to mean and claim that leader has authority over you you should be loyal to them submit to their teachings and leadership over over you this way you will avoid discord in the congregation it is these verses right here in first Thessalonians that they that such denominations often would use to uh, cite as the as the commandment for them to do that uh, and so the authoritarian standard that's here that some people see the majority of scholars university level scholars uh, both at uh, standard universities and at leading uh, theological institutions do not see it that way clearly with these two different uh, interpretations of those early scriptures that we read there today this should make a good point for needed thought and discussion uh, in this Bible study that uh, especially after we're done here in, in the class is in session and you in your own study uh, think about that this variation is is how members that is to how members interpret those verses and how they interpret the relationship between preachers teachers and ministers is, is a general issue in the church ranging as one scholar says from blind submission and adoption to complete suspicion and contempt so this is an area that we need to think about dr smith at, uh, at smu in his commentary suggests this is about edification in which the church looks to itself both for expression uh, of and nurturing and recognizing the need for ministerial work and what needs to be ministered to in the church he says and it's the leaders who are basically charged with that responsibility uh, and therefore uh, that needs to be respected that that needs to be done somebody has to uh, take the take the lead and others need to follow them you can't have people going in all different directions that kind of mutual nurturing would have been a vital necessity in developing a church community of focused on apocalyptic hope in face of the society norms that these early Christians had coming out of these very diverse uh, pagan religions. We have to keep in mind those pagans did not have a single religion. They had m many different ones, many different gods. And so there was a wide amount of variation there. And implied meaning some suggest is that these early Christians must come out of their pagan society, not maintain it or incorporate it into the church, into the Christian church. Of course, history shows it has not been able to completely accomplish that uh, cause it, because the Christian church has adopted some cultural aspects from its pagan background and tried and, and kept them in, in the uh, church's literature, uh, liturgy but by uh, adopting those, reworking them if you will, 
uh, to fit some Christian theology. In verse 14 and 15, Paul warns the church against retribution and says, always seek to do good towards one another and all. Several suggest this all is, the call, is a call to extend the church's love and care also beyond the Thessalonian community. The Greek word here is, that we've seen before is Adelphia or a variation of Adelphia, uh, meaning brotherly love for, for fellow Christians. Dr. Caventi at Baylor says, note that he precedes that statement uh, by identifying three specific groups that are on the margin, idlers, faint-hearted, and the weak. The debate among scholars is whether he is referring to people in the church, outside the church, or both. Another item she points out is that, is that and do others, is that the Greco-Roman society viewed weakness in any form uh, as having absolutely no virtue in any way, shape, or form. Instead, such uh, any sort of weakness was that person was to be degraded in the Greco-Roman society, and especially the Greek society, uh, the Greek the Greek Macedonian society. Thus, Dr. Green suggests he is taking uh, he is talking here within the church primarily. He believes that the church will needs to treat its people differently than society at large treats people who have various weaknesses and so forth. Such people are to be included and you're to have patience with them. Those people in the margin of society are invited by God as well, is the, is the idea here. Not just people of your particular socioeconomic class, race, or ethnicity. And that's coming from Dr. Green, who's the more evangelical scholar that I'm using here. Several scholars note that retaliation or revenge was a cultural norm in the region and both the Romans and Greeks taught it. A failure to revenge nearly any act towards you was viewed very negatively in your society at that time. Mothers taught their sons it is beautiful to make revenge on your enemies. The only restriction that was placed in their society at that time was to don't do it in such a way to bring dishonor uh, to the family or to the republic. So Christ's teachings to turn the other cheek would have been in direct opposition to their society's expectations, states Dr. Green and others. Instead, the cultural norm was to reestablish both personal and community and family honor by strong vengeance against the appropriate parties. So clearly a major paradigm shift would have had to occurred in each individual here to move in and adopt a uh, Christian value that was taught by Christ. Very major issue a paradigm shift would have been necessary relative to the concept of retribution from what their Greco-Roman society expected versus the teachings of Christ. In verse 16 through 18, Paul moves from social obligations uh, and, and the norms to uh, Christian relationships with God and how it affects some elements of the church. Uh, especially church order. These verses get uh, intense discussion among the scholars and are considered problematic. Uh, so they mainly talk about problems and so forth and trying to figure out how, how to get them to fit in to the modern church rather than spending very much time on interpreting what do they mean today? Or I mean, what did they mean at the time they were written? The litany of imperatives phrases here though included uh, 
joyful always, pray constantly, do not despise prophecy, uh, do not quench the Holy Spirit, etc. Uh, the main issue that comes out amongst scholars though is this issue that this seems to be overboard and inconsistent with what of how you could live. And it may very have been, have been that this is kind of what Paul did mean for it to mean all the time and so forth. But the Greek scholars say this is, most Greek scholars say this is very much hyperbole, as it would have been impossible to achieve uh, it literally and do anything else, accomplish anything else in life. Dr. Gaventi uh, notes that in amongst her students, and she's still teaching uh, young people there at, at uh, Baylor, and she says they have great problems with this. Uh, this th this idea of trying to literally interpret, do it always, be praying always. Some suggest there uh, that that these are to reflect happiness regarding the circumstances of knowing that they uh, they have the hope that the pagans didn't. Uh, several scholars also suggest this may relate to some how to the fact that both in the Jewish community and in many of the pagan faiths that there was some place in their religion where someone was praying all the time, be it the temple or, you know, be the local uh, house of, or site of uh, worship for the pagans. So it may imply that that within your church, your church should have someone doing this all the time. There, there are some scholars who go in that direction. Problem is they don't really know. And they don't find very good evidence to back up any of the ideas other than this one that both the Jewish and pagans at the time did have uh, a more or less someone or relative to that local synagogue. Some was essentially praying all the time. So the idea is Christians need to at least keep up with that social standard or maybe go beyond it. Not as an individual, but as an individual congregation, so to speak. The point concerning prophecy is stated with clear uh, qualifications here. That is, test everything, meaning to verify, and hold fast to what is good not said but understood reject them what is bad some suggest he is likely referring here to a specific problem that was occurring maybe among the Thessalonian congregation trying to steer the congregation towards a middle course says Dr. Eugene Boring at uh, Texas Christian Dr. Gene Green uh, as I've said before of the more evangelical event here uh, adds the church has the responsibility to determine whether prophetic utterances that occur in the church are genuine. Some su some suggest he is referring to speaking in tongues here, but most scholars don't believe it goes quite that that it's that specific. It's more general prophecy. How to do such, though Paul doesn't give any guidelines. It's just a general statement. Paul closes 1 Thessalonians, of course, with his typical uh, pattern of greeting and benediction that involve a, a prayer for the church, requesting they uh, pray for the apostles uh, and instructs them to share the holy kiss. Uh, the holy kiss, by the way, uh, was designed to be to show uh, equals, we were to be of equals, in other words, brothers and sisters, etc. Various brothers were of equal rank, we're not. Uh, so the holy kiss is designed to uh, show acceptance and the, the sharing of peace. It was That was all buried in this. Uh, this was a conventional greeting in the Old Testament and among early Christians, and they believe that Paul here is encouraging the adoption of that Middle Eastern norm into these uh, this Greek Macedonian society which by the way also had a uh, greeted one another with a kiss however their kiss 
uh, had to do a lot with the rank, social rank, where you placed it on the person's hand or face or whatever, had to do with a lot of other things. And uh, some suggest that what Paul is doing here is sort of saying all Christians are to be greeted with this holy kiss. That is uh, the same kiss. We're not going to change it because you're of a different uh, social order. So what it, what's exactly there, we don't know, uh, except there appears to have maybe been a problem in this issue. And the social scholars suggest that is one of the areas that they do see, uh, that, the, the, that even though the Greco-Romans greeted one another, uh, that especially close acquaintances, with a kiss, it was placed on the face or hand, depend, where, depending on your rank. And that maybe that's the issue Paul's trying to avoid. Scholars suggest it's Paul's target there was to make it uniform, relative to this holy kiss, to make it uniform, whatever is exactly buried in the, that it, all Christians are to greet one another that way and not modify the style of kiss, the style of greeting, etc. So we have covered the book of First Thess excuse me, First Thessalonians. Uh, try to provide with you what the scholars, the, the lead scholars in this book uh, have to say and hope that that can be of help to you in, as you study First Thessalonians. We'll move into Second Thessalonians after a break uh, and you'll need to remember some of what we had in those first three lessons of uh, First Thessalonians because that sets the stage for what we'll do when we move into Second Thessalonians. Have a good Bible study and hope to see you later.